How you doing, everybody? I'm Jim Ladd. You and I are about to spend the next hour getting to know and hopefully understand one Mr. Pete Townsend. Now, possibly you have heard by this time that Pete Townsend has already, to his credit, one or two records out as lead guitarist and songwriter of The Who. This conversation, however, will not deal with The Who, but rather with Pete Townsend and Ronnie Lane, who have recently released an album called Rough Mix. Also included on this album are several other notables, such as uh, John Entwistle, Eric Clapton, Charlie Watts, Ian Stewart, and my favorite, Bijou Drains. So sit back, get comfortable, and uh, get ready for Townsend and Lane, a rough mix indeed. Well, the idea to do the album with Ronnie in the first place came from Ronnie. Ronnie came to see me. He'd just been working with the Small Faces re revitalization program. And uh, they were planning a, a big comeback. And Ronnie was one of the original members with Steve Marriott and Kenny and Mac. And they were planning an album and a tour and stuff like that. And I think Ronnie... Uh, became incredibly uh, disoriented because I think he'd imagined at the beginning that it was just going to be a sort of a, a reunion concert or two and maybe make an album and uh, because they'd had some success with an old track of theirs Ichiku Park had got in the charts and uh, he came to see me with a with a you know a, a bit of a sad story how you know he'd uh, gotten in too deep and he didn't quite know what to do and he was very worried about not doing the thing with the faces because he felt that financially he you know really he really had to because he felt it would help his his chances with his own albums in the states which believe it or not i think a couple of his own albums weren't even released in america and uh I think Ronnie's, you know, Ronnie's particular style, obviously I've always liked it as a friend, but it's very varied and it's very, it's very uh, down home in a way, but I really felt that Ronnie's work needed a, you know, an opening. Oh, mama. Ronnie's suggestion was that I produce an album for him, and I thought, oh. You know, I don't think I could really handle that. I've not produced an album for a long time, not since Thunderclap Newman, in fact. <laughs> and so I, th I thought that it would be a better idea if we did an album together. So the whole, really, the, the it wasn't a great urge of mine to uh, to do an album. I don't think, in in a sense, that that, that Ronnie had a great drive to do an album. It's 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 a it's not an album born out of a great need or a great you know there's no great reason we did it we did it because we we felt it would be a good thing to do at the time for both of us you know i've explained ronnie's reasons for doing it or wanting to do it my reasons were uh for wanting to do the album were more i suppose because we'd had a heavy year touring with the two in the states and i felt that you know i felt a bit stultified with r road consciousness and I wanted to crack out of that and I felt a session in a studio enjoying knocking about something without great pressure would loosen me up and in indeed it did you know after, as the sessions were going the old pen started and I've you know written a load of stuff since we did the album Pete in a sense um, Rough Mix is not really a, a dual album because you don't actually sing together with Ronnie on uh, all of the tracks. Was there a, a particular problem there for you? It was a problem for Ronnie and I to work as though we were a team, you know. We're not in any way similar either as characters or as musicians. We have the same roots, you know. We both played in early British rock bands in the, in the, in the 60s. Ronnie has gone one way and I've gone the other way. You know, the Who have been, 
been l lucky enough to stick together and go on to to great success. And, and the, the small faces evolved, as probably people know by now, into the faces, and and now back into the small faces again. And uh, Ronnie seems to prefer riding around on a tractor than than you know riding around in the in a TWA aeroplane, you know, all, all, and staying in all of the inns. I don't know back everybody if you just joined us we're talking with pete townsend regarding his collaboration with ronnie lane now because of the highly identifiable style and sound of the who and because rough mix is such a departure from that style i wondered if pete townsend had made a a conscious effort to avoid who like material on this particular album i didn't really make any conscious effort to you know, to avoid who like material, definitely not, you know, I mean, what actually happens when I write is if I write, say, 30 songs for a Who album, 15 of them go by the board as soon as the band get together to listen to them. There'll be one that, that, that Keith will be very cool to. Keith doesn't like, for example, anything which swings in the traditional sense. He doesn't like uh, shuffle rhythms. So anything that's got a shuffle rhythm, for example, rough mix as an instrumental, it goes dun, 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 Well, that's got a shuffle. It's got a backbeat in it. Keith won't play that. He doesn't want... Keith is an on-beat drummer. So that's all that out of the window. Roger doesn't like anything that is too obscure and also doesn't like anything too bitter. You know, one of the only ways that I could get across the bitterness that I felt at the time of the last two albums, Who By Numbers, was by only presenting in just enough songs to fill the album. If I'd given too many alternatives, I wouldn't have got the stuff on. So that's what tends to happen. Now, in this case, uh, the editing process, or the, you know, the what's the word, the selective machinery was completely different. It's a different person standing in a different place from Glyn Johns, who produced the album point of view. I mean, he wasn't trying to produce The Who, he was trying to produce something which had no, you know, no, there was no foregone conclusions, no preconceptions about the way it was going to turn out. And Ronnie's whole supportive thing to me, you know, his whole, his whole desire to, to, to get together on an album with me was because he's always felt that the things that I do uh, outside of the Who, which the general public never get to hear, and so he, he, you know, he he was triumphant, you know, when I when we actually started to do anything that was a little bit different. My baby gives it away is not would not be a good Who song because it's got it's got a shuffle rhythm, you know, which we would never do. The the Who do on beat, you know, I suppose like like the kind of rhythms that you hear coming from today's British punk groups, you know. Pete, on the song uh, Misunderstood, it seems to be a very, uh, well, personal song. And I just wanted to ask you this question about it. Do you really want to be James Dean that bad? Well, I wrote Misunderstood with a bit of a tongue-in-cheek attitude, obviously. It's written, it means a lot of things. I can't really explain exactly what it means. I, I, I don't know, I suppose I wrote it as a bit of a gag. I was thinking about Fonzie at the time when I wrote it. I met that geezer, whoever he is, uh, what's his name? Fonzie. Henry Winkler? Henry Winkler. His real name's better than Fonzie, I think. And, uh, I met him in, I was in a record store in LA and I saw him and when you're in L.A., you get used to seeing stars walking about. You really do. You know, you see this one and you see that one. And half the time, you have to be very careful not to open your mouth and, and, and say anything or draw anybody into conversation because they could just be an extra that you saw in Planet of the Apes or something and you think you know them or you think they're famous. Uh, but really, they're not. Anyway, I sort of nodded and said... And then he started to follow me around the record store. And... Uh, he had this girl with him, so I, you know, obviously there's no uh, homosexual overtures or anything. Uh, but he was following me like, a, you know, like fans rarely do, in fact. I mean, if you see a Who fan in the street, they don't follow you around. They normally, 
a very discursive, you know, they sort of say, hello, Townsend, you know, and that's it, you know. And then they're gone, and you think, yeah, it's great, and the way I'm treated, you know. Rod Stewart and Elton John get all these people falling on their knees and worshipping them as they walk up and down Sunset Strip, but what I get is hello, Townsend. <laughs> You know, and that's about as far as it goes. Anyway, Winkler was following me around. Finally came up and he said, I just wanted to tell you how deeply you've affected my work. And that was it. I mean, I really like the whole sort of Fonzie thing, but I mean, it, it's, for a start, it's fantastically sexist, isn't it? And I suppose that that's one of the 50s James Dean type of kid. And today's punk kids, you know. And yet, there's this common denominator, which is the desire to be misunderstood. Just wanna be, yeah. We'll be back with further misunderstandings of Pete Townsend in a moment. Hey, baby. The E.T. Los Angeles. We're back again with Pete Townsend and our conversation about the Townsend Lane album, Rough Mix. Pete, I think one of the most surprising tracks, if I can say that on this album, is going to be Street in the City, uh, you know, especially for Pete Townsend anyway. Do you yourself consider this a very radical departure from your normal writing? It's not really. I mean, I often paint pictures. 515 was a picture painting exercise, 515 from Quadrophenia. And in fact, I wrote 515 in Carnaby Street, watching the world go by, and I wrote Street in the City in another London street, Fleet Street, where all the, the press world is based, waiting for somebody in the street. And it just, I just tell a story about a little incident that happened where a guy was up on a ledge and a lot of people thought he was going to jump off. And then at the, at the key moment, he suddenly produced a washing leather and started to clean the windows. And uh, I got out my pencil and started to write about it. Face it, it's guitar and voice, essentially. And on top of it is superimposed uh, a orchestral arrangement. The conception of the orchestral arrangement is particularly interesting because it is definitely not the kind of thing which I would ever come up with, say, if I did something on the synthesizer. And that is because I haven't got the skill of the man who did the arrangement, who is actually, coincidentally, my father-in-law. We're a family butcher, you know. <laughs> I asked my father-in-law to do it, Ted Astley, who's been a an orchestral arranger and film music writer of great success in this country anyway for, for, for many years and uh, he, he put this arrangement together ever so quickly and it's a double string orchestra thing you know with a large string orchestra and six big basses and stuff and I actually sat down with the orchestra and played through on the guitar which was a really good experience I haven't done that since Lou Rise and the Tommy played with an orchestra uh, but it's not really that unique you know whenever you write a song you tend to go through it in your head in a various number of ways and one of those ways might be thinking about how it would sound with a bloody great orchestra behind it uh, but I think it's I, I, I think it stands out because it's 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 more of a cooperative effort musically than, than anything I've ever done. I mean, I've contributed the music and the song, and Ted Astley has really contributed a very sort of, you know, innovative arrangement around it, an impressionist piece, which I paint pictures with using the words, but Ted paints, I think, more vivid pictures using the orchestra. I've actually thought about doing a complete album of stuff like this because, with Ted, because Street in the City has attracted so much attention. Street in the city. But this is the track which everybody seems to be drawn to, sometimes because they're confused by it, and sometimes because uh, it fits their idea of what, where music should be going, you know, like my lawyer likes it. Uh, 
But you know what I mean? And, and, and a lot of people that don't like it first time grow to like it. I think I think it's a uh, could be a pointer to the kind of things I might enjoy to go on and do. Pete, in your opinion, what is your uh, favorite track of Ronnie's on this album? From my point of view, the most successful of Ronnie's tracks on the album is April Fall. Uh, I think it's it pleases me greatly because it's really a typical. I don't know that it's a typical Ronnie song. It just really sums him up for me. It's like s such a perfect expression. Musically, it's very gentle. Uh, and beneath Ronnie's sometimes tough exterior, I think does lurk a very gentle person. And it's typically self-effacing. You know, if Ronnie wants to make anybody laugh, it's usually by you know, running himself down in some way, like, you know, appearing at the session too drunk to stand up, and then uh, that, that's, you know, it's like a complete sort of, a, li a little like Keith Moon's self-destructive thing, but, but coming from a slightly different tack. And uh, April Fool is uh, about him. I also really like on April Fool, the thing that really brought it out was the, the, the Dobro by Eric Clapton, which really, he did it in one go, he just sat down, tapped his foot and played this thing first time. And uh, it was very weird because Eric jumped up at the end of it after sitting there and quietly playing this gentle Dobro thing. Jumped up and, you know, was sort of applauding himself like he'd just done a wild, raving guitar, Ted Nugent guitar solo, you know what I mean? He was really knocked out with it, as were we. We'll be back with the conclusion of our conversation with Pete Townsend and... in a moment. One of the never-ending realities of this business is the fact that as soon as an artist releases anything to the public, he also immediately opens himself up to every record reviewer and rock critic who has access to a typewriter and a publication. And God help anyone, anywhere, who may fall into the unspeakable sin of trying something different. I wondered if Pete was expecting an onslaught from this well-known critic clique. You can come under attack for, for, for doing anything these days, music and music or otherwise. I mean, I've been expecting to come under heavy attack ever since I picked up a guitar. Quite why The Who have enjoyed such a period of, a uh, long period of critical immunity, I don't really know, you know, but it's certainly not to do with the fact that we haven't made any mistakes. It's not to do with the fact that we haven't, like everybody else, exploited our audiences to an extent. It's not to do with the fact that we've been completely unselfish, because we, we have been selfish in the past. Maybe it's to do with the fact that The Who is an institution now, and everybody is so glad to, to, to see a band hang together for such a long time that they're afraid that if they knock it, it'll fall apart. But I could safely say now that start knocking, because, you know, you can knock us as hard as you like, you know. Just say what, whatever you feel, folks. The album is very, very little to do with... It's not an indication of, of what the Who are into any more than I think it's an indication of what Ronnie is into as a, a musician. It's very much an indication of what we are both like as individuals, as people, and as friends. It's like... Uh, it's music which has come out of our respective living rooms rather than our respective managerial offices. <laughs> it's music that has come from a need to just play for pleasure and play in the old time sense of sitting down and and enjoying one another's company, enjoying the company of other musicians. Playing with Charlie Watts, for example, was a real trip for me. But not just because I've always wanted to play with Charlie, but once he started playing, I realised what a fundamental 
thing he is in the stone sound one of the great things that i like about it pete one thing that i'm kind of interested in here and not to you know nail it down too far but uh, uh the fact is uh, how did you come up with the title of uh rough mix you know something especially that complimentary to glenn johns well it's had the recording connotations in the recording business a rough mix is a is a you know, a, a, a mix of the music that you've recorded during the day, which you knock up to take home with you to listen to, you know, over tea. And uh, and it's very sort of demeaning to Glyn Johns to call the album Rough Mix, because, you know, from his point of view, <laughs> you know, having spent two weeks trying to get it right, to call it Rough Mix was a good sort of black joke for Ronnie and I to play on Glyn. Glyn liked it, actually. And also, I think Ronnie and I are a very rough mix. I really do. I think we we like oil and water. One of the problems is, you see, Ronnie Lane can't play. <laughs> <laughs> Make no sale for a gift of the will. Peter, there's one track on this album which is conspicuous for the fact uh, that it wasn't written by either you or Ronnie, which is, of course, uh, Till the Rivers All Run Dry, the Don Williams song. Why is that particular track on this album? Well, that's there because of a, a, a mutual fascination that Ronnie and I have got for Don Williams. I mean, he's an amazing bloke, an amazing musician. And uh, Eric Clapton met him and uh, eric and and ronnie are, are good mates and were spending a lot of time together and they invited us to the hammersmith Odeon to see don williams and we didn't really know what to expect i know he was a country artist but i didn't really realize quite how unique he was we sat down and we listened and don started to play and this incredible sort of spiritual peace descended on the hammersmith Odeon, and uh when he sang Till the Rivers All Run Dry, Ronnie and I just looked at one another and realised that this song was a bit like a hymn, a bit like an expression of some sort of uh, spiritual longing. You know, the words go, Till the rivers all run dry, till the sun falls from the sky, till something, 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 I'll still be needing you. And uh, it's, it, I suppose it could be a song about a, a, a man always needing a woman that he's in love with but Ronnie and I saw it as uh, people always needing uh, always living and requiring that need for something each of us identifies it in a different way you know each of us if you don't need anything then you're sort of emulsifying <laughs> you've got to need something and uh, for Ronnie and I, it was very special because we both, as the, after the first few bars of the course, we both looked at one another and we said, this is a, a, a real Maya Baba song, the kind of song which Maya Baba is this, this Indian spiritual master that we both have followed now since the 66, would have loved. And the kind of song which his disciples would love to listen to. 